Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thanks for inviting me to talk about the nomination. Um, I'm just going to babble here while technology kicks in. Um, all right, so you are seeing a full screen picture with a pretty fantastic house as the background? Yes. All right. Um, so uh, my name is Justin Miller. Um, I'm an architectural historian at UW-Milwaukee. Um, I think some of you have heard from my colleague, Gail Klein, who wrote a National Register nomination for the Kohl's Food Store um, about a year and a half ago. Um, and that was also part of the CLG grant project as well. Um, and that one was just listed in the National Register, proud to report. Um, so what I'm going to talk about very brief, briefly tonight is uh, the architectural significance of the Willard and Fern Tompkins House. Um, there's a lot of information in the National Register packet. Um, I'm sure some of you have looked through it already. Um, not going to go through all the background information. I'm just going to touch on the architectural significance, which is what the um, review board is going to be looking for when they consider this nomination. So the Willard and Fern Tompkins House, um, it's an international style house. It was built in 1937, designed by the architectural firm of Beatty and Strang. Uh, the house is locally significant under criterion C in the area of architecture. Um, it is an outstanding example of the international style. Um, and the period of significance for the Tompkins House is 1937, coinciding with the year of its construction. Um, the primary character defining features of the house are the uh, cubic massing, the flat roof, the banded windows that turn the corner, um, the wide siding, its efficient floor plan, um, and it's uh, sort of minimal interior finishes. The house is in excellent condition and it retains a high degree of integrity. Um, this is for my uh, Shippo presentation. I hope, I hope we all know where we are in Monona. That's where the Black Star is. Um, so here's a little bit more uh, in depth about the house. Um, the Tompkins House is being nominated as an example of the international style. It was actually published in Architectural Record magazine in 1940. Um, a page from the, that publication is included on the left there. The international style had its roots in Europe in the 1920s and it spread to America in the 1930s. Um, this architectural style avoided any references to past architectural styles or movements. Um, it was, as one, one critic described it as, completely independent of specific materials, sites, or cultural traditions. Uh, so what that means in practical terms is um, flat roofs, boxy massing, and very smooth wall surfaces. Um, another uh, another um, key feature of the international style was really precise composition. Um, and you can see that in this, which is one of the original blueprints for the house, um, everything lines up with something else in a really complex and sculptural way when you see the house in three dimensions. Um, the treatment of windows was another key element of the international style. Uh, there were a couple ways that they um, typically handled windows. The most common was to arrange the windows in horizontal ribbons. Um, typically, windows would turn the corner, meaning they, they wrapped around the corner without any sort of structural support being visible on the outside. Um, and there's really minimal exterior trim or reveals with the windows. Um, the Tompkins House was designed by Madison architects Hamilton Beatty and Alan Strang. Beatty and Strang were among the earliest architects in the country to design in the international style. Uh, their houses are primarily concentrated in and around Madison, um, mostly Shorewood Hills and Monona. Um, Beatty and Strang's houses represented a new and progressive approach to residential design. And today they are recognized as part of the beginning of modern architecture in America. Um, Beatty and Strang's design for the Tompkins House um, really illustrates the key principles of the international style. So the house consists of a couple flat roofed cubic volumes um, that are wrapped in this single continuous cypress cladding that reinforces the geometric volumes of the house. Um, the windows are arranged in horizontal bands 
Many of them wrap around the corners um, as determined by the internal room layout or by external views. Um, here we're looking at the front door with a little porch and then the corner of the living room. Um, neither the, the floor plan nor the exterior elevations are symmetrically composed, um, but they rather uh, they, they use um, balanced massing and carefully composed window placement to create a sense of order. Um, the house doesn't have any applied decoration on the outside. Um, it only has minimal trim around the doors, windows, and roof. Um, and instead of decoration, the cypress siding, the geometric massing, and that precise composition of each facade gives the house its um, distinctly modern appearance. Um, so these are the character defining features that make the Willard and Fern Tompkins house an excellent example of the international style of architecture. Um, here's a look at the second story porch uh, with the sun deck behind us. Um, inside, the house has a really efficient, um, highly functional arrangement of spaces. Um, this is the living room. Notice we're looking at how the windows turn the corners. Uh, and the fireplace is on our left side. It's sunk flush into the face of the wall. It doesn't project at all. Um, there you can see the fireplace on the right. And the dining room is essentially an extension of the living room, living room space. Uh, it's a large L-shaped room. Um, here is a peek inside the uh, downstairs powder room. It has most of its original fixtures. Um, even though this room is entirely indoors, it also has this window placed high up on the wall that uh, is arranged so that it's located just over the floor of the second story sun porch. Uh, it's a very clever way of bringing light into the powder room. Um, on the right side is a view of one of the upstairs bedrooms. They all have their original built-in wardrobes. Um, there's a lot of built-ins downstairs as well. Uh, there's the living room bookcase on the right, I'm sorry, on the left, and the dining room buffet in the upper right-hand corner. Um, these are both shown in photos as they are today, as well as um, blueprints as the architects specified them in the original drawings. Uh, and the original built-in kitchen cabinetry is there. Uh, as well as designed by Beatty and Strang. Um, the kitchen is its really incredible. The kitchen cabinetry has survived. Um, the Swiss architect Le Corbusier uh, is famous for saying a house is a machine for living in. Um, and I think this kitchen cabinetry really <laughs> exemplifies that. Um, so just to sort of reiterate and wrap up, um, the Tompkins house was designed by uh, Beatty and Strang, built in 37. Um, the house features its distinctive cubic forms with flat roofs, uh, horizontal bands of windows, cypress siding, uh, the absence of any exterior ornamentation, and a, an efficient functional interior arrangement of spaces. These are all elements that embody the principles of the international style. These character-defining features have been maintained and preserved since the house was constructed, and today the house is in excellent condition with a high degree of integrity. Because of its significance as an international style house, the Willard and Fern Tompkins House is being nominated to the National Register at the local level on the Criterion C in the area of architecture. And that's all that I have. And I'm happy to answer any questions. That's wonderful. Hey, Justin, can you hear me? Yep. Um, how did you get a copy of the thesis by Philipp Philippowitz? I did. Um, is, that, is that easy to get a copy of? It is not. <laughs> um, it's, it's available on, um, so, so um, Diane Filipowicz is an architectural historian. Um, she wrote her uh, doctoral thesis on the firm of Beatty and Strang. Um, she wrote it at Cornell and Cornell has one microfilm copy of it. Um, so I actually, we were able to um, obtain the copy of the microfilm from Cornell, and then we have facilities to scan it. So UWM now has a um, digital PDF copy of the entire thesis. Um, so we, could get, we could get a digital copy from UWM? Yep, I'd, I'd be happy to share, share a PDF of that with you. Oh, that would be great. 
I'd love yeah. to have a access to it. Yep, it's a it's a really good book. Um, it's it's really a lot of useful information. I'm not sure what the copyright issues are, um, but I think as a reference copy, that's not a problem for sharing okay. purposes. Okay. Um, Doug, could you follow up with, or could I send that to you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'd, I'd be happy uh, once we know kind of the parameters. I can I can share or print it off or you know however uh, to do that appropriately. Absolutely. Yeah, Justin, it was a great nomination. I loved all the detail. Um, there's lots and lots of great information in there that I hadn't actually read before. So that was good. Thanks. Thanks. It was it was fun to research. They were they, the the Tompkins seemed like they were interesting people, as were a lot of the people who were building these houses in the 30s. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, sometimes the story of the owners can be as interesting as the architecture. Mm -hmm. Who are the current um, current residents of Mass? Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Hence the preserved kitchen. Right. <laughs> and Exciting. Yeah, exciting. Yeah. Oh, what a wonderful treat for those on the committee to have this yeah. Yeah. speaker. I really, really enjoyed that presentation. Thank you. Would it be appropriate to move approval or recommend to the KSR Preservation Office that we uh, approve of this nomination? I think with, with how it was noticed, uh, at least a recommendation to staff to prepare a letter, I think would be appropriate rather than a, a formal action necessarily, okay. but a, a, maybe a recommendation um, to you know, prepare an, a, a letter of support of, of this nomination to the National Register. I think would be I so move. I'll second that. Is there anything further that we need to discuss about the draft? Uh, I just, have, just I have some motion. Minutes that I'll just okay. pass yeah. on to. Okay. Should we approve the if I yeah, can I get a vote on the motion? Please? Oh yeah, oh, I'm the sorry. First all in so all in favor. Uh, I, 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 um, so I have edits from, from Rebecca and I will pass those um, sort of copy edits for, for that. And I will also just mention um, there was some email back and forth from the property owner um, when he had reviewed the, the application. Uh, and I think Justin did a really good job of sort of addressing those. Um, there were some comments about um, the wider neighborhood context with Frostwoods, but also um, the recognition of the uh, previous occupants of the land and the, the area, um, and really how and maybe Justin, you can address this a little bit more, but how that's sort of general um, and widely accepted that that's typically an innovation as well. Sure, sure. Yeah, so the um, the property owner ha um, uh, had some, as Doug said, questions about, um, so you've noticed at several points in the nomination, there is a statement about um, the ancestral homelands acknowledgement um, that begins a section. Um, and then there's also some discussion about archaeological components of the property. Um, and those are both uh, standard required elements of a National Register nomination. Um, the land acknowledgement especially is something that the Wisconsin Historical Society adopted a few years ago. Um, they developed this land acknowledgement with tribal representatives, um, as well as people from the Historical Society. Um, and it's just a way of um, putting in writing in every National Register nomination that comes from Wisconsin, this acknowledgement that there were people here a long time before the white folks showed up in the 1830s. Um, and so this is, they've gotten a lot of good feedback from the National Park Service on this land acknowledgement statement. And so that's just standard practice now. Um, there was also a question, uh, which, is, which is a really good question about um, discussing archaeological sites on the property. Um, and this is sort of a National Register technicality. Um, the the archaeology statement essentially says um, there is a possibility that there 
might be archaeological sites located at this property, but we didn't look at them as part of this nomination. Um, that is because, according to the National Park Service, you cannot say there are no sites until you've excavated the entire property. Um, mm -hmm. And Matt didn't want to dig up his whole lawn for this. So, <laughs> so we say there is um, none have been identified, but the possibility is there. I have one more question. Were the architectural drawings, were those uh, in Matt's possession? Matt had those drawings. Um, there's also the, there are Beatty and Strang drawings all over the place. Um, they're not collected in one central repository. Um, some of his, some of, some of Beatty's kids have some. Oh. And then um, Strang, so Alan, Alan Strang um, actually ended up founding Strang Architects later on in life. And they have a very, few, they have a handful of early Beatty and Strang drawings, but they actually destroyed all of the early records oh. when they were in the process of establishing a new firm identity. So they, they tossed all the old drawings. <laughs> oh, say la vie. Yeah. <laughs> but so the ones you got in the nomination were from a couple those of were, different locations? Th those were all from Matt. Okay. Um, with the exception of the the publication and architectural record. Okay. Got it. Yep. Is there any more discussion on this item? Questions? Thank you very much, Justin. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.